Hi everyone, this is Lawrence Watkins and welcome to the Financial Juneteenth 5. These are my five favorite articles as it relates to Black finance, wealth, and business for today, October 19th, 2020. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the first article today comes from the Houston Chronicle and it is entitled Business Friendly Houston, Not Always Free Market for Black Communities, History Shows. Um, and it digs deep into some of the history in regards to business um, of the city of Houston and how blacks were often marginalized from having the same economic opportunities as whites and other people uh, who were actually in the city. So unfortunately, there is a paywall up for this site and I do not have a subscription to the Houston Chronicle yet, uh, but since I'll be moving there next year, um, I'll go ahead and get one soon. Uh, so I'll just have to read this article through my Feedly account. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So uh, the article starts off saying, but according to interviews with historians, sociologists, and, and economists, the markets that built Houston were never fully free at all, uh, at least not for Black residents. Job discrimination met Black workers when thousands of them arrived in Houston during the Great Migration of the early 20th century. Redlining during the 1940s starved black homeowners and business of credit, segregation prevented full participation in the economy, environmental contamination disproportionately sickened black neighborhoods. And the rest of the article really goes into detail with um, all of these different areas in terms of redlining, um, segregation, and also environmental contamination. Uh, there was a good quote in here from uh, Bernadette Pruitt. Uh, she's an assistant professor of history at Sam Houston State University. She states, people say we are all equal now, so every, everybody's got the same shot. But is that really true? Uh, when you look at the country, the free, uh, the free enterprise, uh, that's been true for some people, but not for everyone. A lot of people are playing catch up. So the article uh, talks, uh, uh, goes on to talk about the broken economic ladder. It states, uh, remaining in the South instead of heading to the North meant staying in a region where racist violence, violence was rampant, Pruitt says, uh, but Black migrants risked, uh, risked it to keep families intact, find jobs, and chart a path forward uh, uh, towards financial security. Uh, black laborers, however, found they were excluded from more lucrative blue collar jobs at refineries, steel foundries and construction companies. They were hired for more dangerous jobs in manufacturing, shipping and railroads, performing grueling work at lower pay than their white peers. Middle class black men and women struggled to break into skilled jobs, even if they had college degrees. At times, black professionals faced violence when they took jobs such as firefighters and engineers, Pruitt said. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, we hear about this, you know, all over the place. And even though this article is specifically talking about Houston, uh, we hear the same types of stories in cities all across um, America in terms of how systemic racism uh, really affected uh, the lives and currently still does currently affect the lives of uh, black Americans. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s, the federal government began offering loans to help low and middle income people buy homes but restricted the lending to certain areas through the practice known as redlining. Uh, so we're, of course, very familiar with redlining. Um, black families were entitled to benefits of the GI bills and other programs, but often prevented from obtaining them due to discrim discriminatory practices. Oak Forest, northwest of the Heights, was the first government-backed development in Houston to exclude people of color, according to uh, research by Texas Housers. I'm a local uh, nonprofit. Uh, so I found this article to be extremely interesting, um, even uh, when it was talking about uh, some of the environmental factors, what they call the spell of the smell of money um, in regards to the refineries uh, that are in the city. Uh, but of course, most of those refineries were in black uh, neighborhoods. So it says, uh, here's a stat. Black people, here we go. Yeah, black people on average are exposed to 56% more air pollution that leads to heart and breathing deaths than they create, according to the 2019 uh, study published in the uh, National Academy of Sciences. Non Hispanic white are on average exposed to 17% less air pollution than they actually cause. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I would highly suggest you reading this article uh, if you have a subscription. Uh, to uh, the Houston Chronicle. Otherwise, this was a good summary um, in regards to what it's talking about uh, and what people, you know, 
you know, you hear, well, just politicians in general, but there's this American ethos that there's a free market. Uh, but as you really take a deeper dive and a deeper look at history, uh, we know that it's not always free for everyone involved. And this shows you why policy matters um, and politics matters uh, when it comes to um, economics, but also as it you know, relates to just the well-being of our different communities. So check that out in the uh, Houston Chronicle. The second article today uh, is for, as a press release. So it states, Multicultural Food Service and Hospitality Alliance, Fourth Movement, I think that's how you pronounce it, and PepsiCo collaborate to increase pathway, pathways to Black franchise ownership. So this is a, a good opportunity for anyone who is watching this. Um, I was actually on an interview, or excuse me, on a panel with uh, the brother of the uh, Fourth Movement uh, CEO, or I guess the brother of the person who leads up this Fourth Movement um, organization. Uh, uh, so the, the Webb family, so shout out to the Webb family in uh, Los Angeles. But the article states, today, the Multicultural Food Service and Hospitality Alliance uh, fourth Movement uh, and PepsiCo announced a formal collaboration to provide leadership development and increase business ownership opportunities for Black people in the restaurant industry. Together, they are launching the Pathways to Black Franchise Ownership Program, an innovative personal development training initiative that equips potential business owners to operate high-performing businesses. Uh, so here's the interesting stat. Recent data shows that only 8% of restaurants are owned by Black people. Uh, the, the program's goal is to uh, create 100 Black franchise owner, or franchise restaurants by the end of 2020 and to continue growing at that number. Um, there was a quote in here from, so this is the president the founder of MFHA. Uh, and the, yeah, so I want to get to this quote by Kareem Webb um, of uh, Fourth Movement. Okay, actually before that, PepsiCo is founding, the founding sponsor, uh, committing $2.5 million over the next five years. So that's about $500,000 a year uh, to this effort. And uh, Kareem states, uh, through this collaboration, we'll help hundreds of people become business owners who otherwise, in all likelihood, wouldn't have had the resources to do so. These folks will experience improved outcomes for themselves and their families, enabling them to become civically engaged leaders in communities across America. This growth will benefit us all. Uh, so if you want to learn more about this, uh, this organization and this opportunity for uh, Pathways to Black Franchise Ownership, please visit mfha.net. That's mfha.net. Um, and uh, you will learn more. So I'll do my best to get Kareem on here to talk to you all directly regarding this program, uh, but I think it's a good opportunity for everyone listening today. The next article uh, comes from Amsterdam News, uh, which I believe is a black owned newspaper in uh, New York City. Uh, so it states, black super PAC urges candidates and parties to spend millions with black businesses. So I believe this is a Republican super PAC that is uh, leading this initiative. So it states, one of America's leading black conservative political action committee uh, committee has instituted or instituted a national effort to help black owned businesses earn some of the billions of dollars spent during America's political campaigns as of 2020 or as the 2020 election year hits the home stretch. Black PAC, a federally registered super PAC, is spearheading an initiative urging all candidates, political parties, political action committees, and donors to take the Art Fletcher pledge. To commit the or to commit to spending 10% of their funding revenues or both with black owned, uh, black owned and or businesses and financial institutions. Uh, so the black pack chairman is a guy by the name of George Farrell. Uh, George stated, any candidate, Democrat, Republican, or independent that cannot execute the ability to spend 10% of campaign funds with black businesses cannot be trusted to operate honestly as an elected government official and should not earn our votes. Uh, so that's a you know, very strong statement. I think it's you know, a true statement as well. The plan required, or excuse me, the plan required federal, oh, okay. Yeah, this is actually uh, a little history about the guy or the man that the plan is named after of. 
of the Art Fletcher, or so his name was Art Fletcher. He was the former Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Labor in the Nixon administration. Uh, Fletcher was a Black Republican and a lifelong civil rights activist referred to himself as the father of affirmative action enforcement uh, for his work with the uh, 1969 Philadelphia Plan. So I did not know very much about this plan. I, I knew about, I guess, uh, you know, as it relates to Nixon and what we see as affirmative action right now, how it was really structured under that Republican uh, president as um a way to push back against, you know, all the civil or all of the civil unrest of the 1960s. Uh, so uh, the plan, the plan required federal government contractors in Philadelphia's construction trades to set goals and timetables for hiring min minority workers. It gave the business autonomy on how to increase minority employment. However, if the goals were not reached, uh, the contracts would be terminated by the federal government. Um, so I did not know much about in regards to Art Fletcher and, and his uh, his conservative plan uh, back then. But uh, if you want to know more about what they're doing with the Black Pack, um, I think you can visit blackpack.gop uh, to actually learn more and actually sign the pledge if this is something up your alley. Uh, the next article comes from Skift. So Skift is a major news player in uh, the travel industry. Um, and the title of the article is uh, Black History and Culture Attractions Still Looking for Corporate Donors to Match All the Black Lives Matter Rhetoric. Uh, so, yeah, basically, of course, just like everything else, uh, now nearly five months after the killing of George Floyd, Black history and cultural institutions in the United States that draw tours from all over the globe say the support from donations has been anything but consistent. Uh, one of, and this is a quote by Bridget Jones, she's the curator of social history at Tennessee State Museum. She says, one of the biggest issues we see right now is the misinformation and miseducation of non-minority populations. When you look at our erasure from history, from the literary movement, the classical music movement, and then you add physical erasure with what you see from the police, what you see is America's true relationship with Black Americans, and it's that of a stepchild. Uh, so basically, you have a lot of uh, people in the arts uh, talking about how they're not, you know, people uh, or these organizations and corporations have continually talked about Black Lives Matter, that type of thing. But many haven't put their pocketbooks uh, where their you know, collective mouth is. Uh, so there's a quote in here a little later from Black American West Museum chairperson Daphne Rice Allen. Um, she's kind of being a little, a little bit of a, I don't know, I can say apologist, but yeah, just you know, trying to think through some of the reasons why corporations aren't as committed as the words we're talking. Uh, she stated, corporations are probably trying to deal with their own BL BLM internal issues. So the art, so the art industry, just like the tourism industry, is probably going to have to support itself in terms of social justice. Uh, so yeah, this is a you know interesting article. There's a quote that ended um, the article that says a 2018 Mandela uh, Mandela research. Um, study claims that African Americans contribute a whopping $63 billion to the American travel and tourism economy and are more likely to travel to a, a location connected to their heritage. All right, so check this out on skiff.com. Of course, the uh, link is in the description for this article as well. The last article comes from Nebraska's uh, PBS and NPR stations. Um, so I have no idea how I found this article, <laughs> but I'm glad I did. And I think it's a good way um, to tie in today's discussions um, in terms of the articles, um, especially as it relates to the first one we discussed today about uh, Houston and its lack of free market. Uh, so this says, why are there so few black farmers in the Midwest? Yeah, so um, yeah, it's talking about a couple of different families. So one is Charles Downs, uh, who uh, runs uh, one of, I guess, a farming stand, who brought it from uh, the Step family, which was a black family uh, before the Civil War, I believe, um, a black family uh, that was farming. Um, I believe they're talking about Iowa. So I'm not sure if they're talking about Iowa or Nebraska. But anyway, there's this black family in the Midwest. Uh, and uh, so by 1900, 
Iowa had about 300 African American farm families in various parts of the state, but in 1970 that number had dropped to about 175 uh, families. Uh, David Broadnax, uh, he's a professor at Trinity Christian College. Um, I think he had a quote in here. Well, actually, before we get to his quote, uh, some scholars have suggested that farming, especially in the Great Plains, function as one step on a path towards economic independence that would allow future generations to dr thrive in other places with the land passing out of the family as everyone migrated to urban and suburban places. Uh, so Broadnax had a quote in here, there's definitely disagreement within the black community about the importance of land as economic power and its importance on farming or of farming. There's definitely a strong sense among some African Americans that we need land, we need economic power in this country and land is power. I definitely do agree with that. Um, I don't know if there's too much disagreement um, with regards to, I guess, land being power. Um, I think, you know, more than that, there's just, um, you know, misinformation and you know people not being informed in terms of how important land actually is um, as it relates to uh, power within the within the United States. Uh, so yeah, yeah, so there's some additional quotes in here, uh, but black farmers repeatedly faced discrimination that prevented them from getting appropriate loans and being able to keep up with the pace of modernization. So, um, you know, of course, that's a continuation of the story that we have talked about just throughout the weeks with the FJT5. Uh, there's another reason why there, uh, I guess, a lack of black farmers as well. Um, so for the Steps family, so reading right here, for the Step family and others, something else contributed to the end of their time as black farmers, and that is assimilation. Uh, so uh, Jeffrey Schmick, Cheryl Patterson, and Brian Step, all of whom had, who identify as white, started researching the small cemetery where their grandfather is buried just down the road from the melon stand, right? So, you know, after a few generations, um, I guess they assimilated into whiteness. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges and problems with uh, integration um, is uh, the, the loss of uh, black culture. Uh, Schmick said, so I believe it's uh, Jeff Schmick, who is uh, the grandson of uh, the black man who started uh, the farm. There was quite a bit more talk about our Indian heritage that then there was our black heritage. So, um, you know, that's just, you know, some, some interesting, uh, you know, some interesting perspective in regards to, you know, what's really going on. The article ended by saying, uh, but Broadnax, the historian says, amid renewed calls for economic empowerment, farmland ownership hasn't risen to the same level as supporting black businesses. What I haven't seen is the, or excuse me, what I haven't seen is that being addressed from a perspective of farming and land ownership uh, so what I haven't seen is that being addressed, excuse me, is that being addressed from a perspective of uh, farming and, and black ownership. So nobody's really talking about, you know, renewed calls for economic empowerment, farmland ownership in terms of you know, supporting black you know, businesses. Not saying that no one has said that, but it definitely doesn't seem to be a big part of the conversation in 2020. Uh, so that came from the uh, Nebraska Public Radio and PBS stations um, as well. So. All right, so that's my or my five favorite articles today and our financial Juneteenth five for today. Please make sure you uh, like, share, and subscribe before you get out of here. Um, also, like I said, this is still a test run um, of the FJT five. So if you like this segment, uh, please go ahead and mention that in the comments. Uh, if you want to see me improve in some sort of way as it relates to delivering this type of news and information to you, uh, let me know that as well. Uh, but on behalf of Financial Juneteenth, my name is Lawrence Watkins. Take care, be blessed, and have a wonderful day. All right, bye bye.